the Alliance for Community Trees webcast series. This is our first webcast of the new year, 2013, and we're kicking it off with a bang on a great topic that's gotten a lot of interest. We're very glad you can join us. The Alliance for Community Trees webcast series is a monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. Our trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience two organizations, methods, materials, and approaches. These sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with our two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for about 10 to 15 minutes, and we'll follow that with 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, if anyone here uh, would like certification from a state landscape architecture board, they usually only require a certificate of completion if you want credit for attending this webcast. We can provide that to you, so shoot us an email afterwards if you'd like one of those. This webcast is an educational program of the Alliance for Community Trees. We're a national network of local organizations that are working in their communities to plant and care for trees to improve the environment and their neighborhoods. If you're not already a member, please consider joining. There are lots of benefits, and we'd love to have you as part of this national network, speaking with one voice for urban forestry. Today's session is Mapping the Urban Forest, part of our series on tree technology. Mapping the Urban Forest helps us understand the structure and state of our existing tree canopy and gives us insight on how to maintain and improve this important resource. While the actual task of taking tree inventory can seem daunting, some cities and nonprofits are capitalizing on their volunteer base to help them get the job done. Crowdsourcing can be a useful tool to educate residents about urban forests, having them locate and measure trees in their neighborhoods. Low-tech and high-tech options make it easier for any size organization or community to implement and manage a successful crowdsourced tree mapping program. We've got uh, two speakers here today with a lot of experience doing this work. I think you'll learn a lot from them, and we're very excited to have them join us. First up this afternoon is Deb Boyer, who serves as the project manager for Open Tree Map implementation. Um, she also contributes to marketing and product development efforts at Olivia, the technology company. Deb serves as the project manager for phillyhistory.org website, where she assists with the daily operations of the project, including metadata entry and photo digitization. Uh, she clearly knows a lot about technology, websites, and innovative web tech. Deb received her Bachelor of Arts in English from Central Michigan University before moving to Chicago, where she completed a Master's of Public History at Loyola University. And before coming to Xavier, Deb worked at several cultural institutions on a variety of curatorial, exhibit design, and educational projects. But we are very excited to hear about Open Tree Map. So with that, uh, Deb, please take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Leland. Um, we're, I'm really excited to be here to talk about Open Tree Map. Um, if anyone has any problems hearing me during the presentation, please uh, let Leland know in the chat and he'll pass that information along to me. So let's see if we can get my slides up. There we go. Great. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit a bit today about Open Tree Map. And you're probably wondering, let's go back one, there we go, um, what we're going to cover. There's a lot that I'm going to try to get through in the next 10 to 15 minutes, but hopefully it'll give you an overview of what we're doing with some of our partners to use urban forest mapping and the public to get a better idea of what trees are out there and how we can plan for the future. So briefly what I'd like to go over today is to look at somewhat of the history and the partners of Open Tree Map and, and really what it is. And at its core, it's the ability to both search and display tree data, but then also allow the public to get involved in the process of adding and editing that data. And then I very much want to leave uh, room for questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat and Leland will pass them on to me uh, at the end of the presentation. So what is Open Tree Map? Um, at its core, Open Tree Map Okay, there we go. I think I'll get a hold of this uh, clicking slides eventually. Okay, so OpenTreeMap at its core is an open source tree data management system for collaborative geography enabled urban tree inventory. That's a lot of words to basically mean that we want to take our tree data 
out of the databases, out of the filing cabinets, and put it online in a web environment where people can engage with it and where the public can become an interactive part of our urban forestry initiative. So the main features of the software are, are pretty straightforward. We want people to be able to search and explore data. Um, we want people to be able to, Leland, I think I'm having some problems with the slides. Yeah, I see that. Let me, uh, for you. Sorry, everyone. Hold on just a second. I promise this is no reflection on the OpenTreeMap software. <laughs> okay. Is this the right place? That looks great. Let me jump in and let everyone know this is actually beginning this new year. It's our first time uh, we're using this new GoToWebinar software for presenting the webinars. Uh, our apologies if we're on a little bit of a learning curve. We'll get it right time and be pros for it uh, at the next session. All right. Take okay. It up. Uh, let's, let's okay, great. Let's, let's try from here. Okay. okay. Uh, so let's see if that advances the slide. You should be able to click that little left or right arrow. Yep. Okay, let's just go that way. Okay, thank you for bearing with us, everyone. Um, oh, or not. All right, so Deb, how about, um, oh gosh. Uh, you just let me know when you want the next slide to go, and I'll advance it. Okay, I think, yeah, I think it might be on auto advance, Leland. All right, why don't you okay. just tell me when you want the next slide, and let's go the for the next slide, slide then. Yeah. I enjoy having somebody to do my manual labor for me. That sounds okay. great. <laughs> Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the, the main overview features of OpenTreeMap are this ability to search and explore data and be able to view these ecosystem benefits and add trees and upload tree photos and just generally let people explore our, our urban forestry data in a new way. Um, so on this next slide, uh, you can see that this certainly is not a, a solo initiative. So um, Leland, could you advance it once? There we go, great. Um, there's been a number of partners and um, funders who have been involved in this process for a long time, and I'll go over the history of the project briefly as well. Um, obviously, we as AVS Software Company are, are one of the developers on the project. We have great partners in Urban Ecos, Colleen Vargas's consulting firm out in California, and Phil Silva and Liz Berry from TreeKit in New York. And the OpenTreeMap project has received funding from CAL FIRE, from USDA, and it's resulted in a lot of individual tree maps that have their own partnerships involved in each individual implementation. So the logos across the bottom of the screen are all of the people involved in just the Philly version of Open Tree Map. And this, this map is being used in a number of different cities, and each city has a huge list of partners. We really believe in the power of collaboration and partnerships when using technology. Next. So uh, you might be wondering why I am talking to you. Um, so I wanted to give a brief background about Azavia. Uh, we're a small family-owned software company that was founded in 2000. We're something known as a B Corporation, which means that we, we try to focus on projects that we believe have social value to the community. So using technology for, for the good of all people, which I know sounds, sounds very you know, happy and fluffy, but we really want to take on projects that are intellectually stimulating. We do primarily geospatial and web development. We're based in Philadelphia, and like I said, we're small, about 30 people. Next slide. So how did we get involved in, in OpenTreeMap? Um, a couple of ways, actually. We had applied for something called a Small Business Innovation Research Grant from USDA, and the purpose of the grant was to be able to um, focus on bringing web-based technology to this idea of crowdsourcing the urban forest. After we received the grant, we quickly heard about this initiative in California called the Urban Forest Map in San Francisco, which accomplished a lot of the um, objectives we were aiming for. So rather than starting from scratch, we ended up combining forces with that initiative and built even more than we expected to be able to do in our first phase. Uh, that first phase of development resulted in Philly Tree Map and Green Print Maps, which is a map for Sacramento. Um, we eventually released the code as an open source project, and we were then fortunate to receive a second phase of funding from USDA to do additional development. And that's led to even more cities adopting the tree map software, which is very exciting. Could you advance the slide? So some of you might be wondering, um,
sorry for this, everyone. <laughs> Trying out a new webinar software is never easy. Um, could you go back one more, Leland? Okay, so some of you might be wondering what open source software means. Um, it, it basically means that there's no license fee to use the software. Any code that we write for the OpenTreeMap platform is made available online where anybody can download it and then can also contribute their own options to the code. That means that it's maintained by a community of users. It's not just one group of people who are working on it. It's not just us. And if we do build something for a, a city or if another city develops something to the platform, those new features are back added back into the code so that everybody can use the, the software. Um, it's accessible at opentreemap.org, but we always like to let people know it's, it's not something where you click a button and it magically installs itself. You will need a software developer who has some experience with geographic software. So that's something to keep in mind. But it was important to us to, to be developing something that wasn't proprietary, that wasn't locked away so that you know, only one organization could use it or, or only a certain group of people. I think that one of the best things that we've discovered about the urban forestry world in the last two years is that it's, it's a very collaborative, welcoming community where sharing information is very important. And we wanted this project to be part of that. So with all of that background, I want to walk through a few, few slides that show how various cities are using this idea of crowdsourcing and mapping to, to support the urban forest. And the first initiative is with search and display. So on this screen right here, you can see a version of the Philly tree map. And there's a couple of different ways that people are allowed to search the database. So the data that's in this, uh, this version of OpenTreeMap, OpenTreeMap is the software that powers the maps in the different cities. So they're all called different things. It's called Philly tree map here in Philadelphia where we're based. The, the data comes from both the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and Philly Parks and Rec. And people can search the data by typing in an address, by selecting a neighborhood from the list, by selecting a species, or even more options. Next slide. So some of those options are things like advanced filters. Maybe you want to search by the diameter of the tree or the dates when it was planted. Or, or maybe you want to add a little bit of an educational component as well and tell people how to search by trees that are native to the region or that have edible fruits and nuts. So now it becomes a way to let people explore the trees that are around their community. Next slide. Once you've uh, searched for the different information, there, there's a couple of ways to learn more about any specific tree. So each of the trees is identified on the map by a dot. If you click on that dot, you get some basic information, things like the species, the trunk diameter, the closest address. If you click on that link right there, though, to view all details, you go to the tree's detail page. Next slide. We kind of like to think of this as the tree's uh, Facebook page. It's basically everything about the tree. So you might have images of the tree that people have uploaded. You might have satellite imagery. You might have um, Google Street View integration so people can get a live action shot of the tree. You might have a list of the recent contributions or the eco benefits that are generated by the tree. And as you can see, the, the cities all take a little bit of a different stance as to how this should be displayed. This is from Grand Rapids and it's, uh, it's a little bit more colorful. It's displayed in a different way than the Philly version. Next slide. So, you know, that, that's one level of engagement, but the next level of engagement is, is pushing it a step farther and getting people to recognize the value of their trees. So next. Uh, we integrate with iTree so that we're actually able to show the, the um, ecosystem benefits that are generated either by individual trees or by all of the trees that are returned for a specific search. So somebody could search their own neighborhood or search a zip code or something like that and see a breakdown of how much that tree is saving them both economically and ecologically. And people get really excited about this, as I'm sure you all know. Next slide. Uh, so here you can see an example of how you might uh, display information for a single tree. Next. But most importantly, to take a step beyond just displaying data, we wanted to actually get people involved in the process of mapping. And there's a couple ways to do that. First, as you all know, it's incredibly difficult to maintain a current tree inventory. So we actually enable people to be able to add trees. And we do that by asking them to specify an address. They then can move the little dot, you can faintly see it here, the orange dot on the map, to the exact location where the tree would be located. Next slide. 
And then there's additional options that they can complete in order to add more information. So if they know the species or, or if they want to try to figure it out using the tree key, they can add that. If they add the diameter, as soon as we have species and diameter, now we can calculate ecosystem benefits. And maybe you want information about the planting site. All of a sudden, th this list of options becomes more and more helpful in terms of getting the public engaged. You know, people love making sure every spot is filled out, every field is complete. Next. And after they're done, it's as simple as add, clicking an Add This Tree button. As soon as that button is clicked, the information is available online for everybody to see. So there's no waiting period. There's no syncing period. The information is immediately available, which is very uh, appealing and engaging to people. Next. You can also edit data. So if there's data already in the database, you can simply go in and edit specific fields, maybe the species, maybe the height. And those fields can be customized, so maybe only certain groups of users can edit certain things. We, we understand that there are data quality concerns. And that's actually the whole next section. So next slide. So I'm sure right now some of you are like, oh, this is all perfect in an, an ideal world, but in the actual world where people make mistakes but we still need accurate data, what do we do? There's a, we, we recognize that's a really valid concern. Some people would say that collecting bad data is, is almost worse than having no data at all, and I would agree. So we built in a number of parameters to try to keep the data as accurate as possible. First, there is a pending system that's optional. So in Sacramento, the map that you're looking at right now, if somebody edits a tree that was in, initially entered by the city, that edit is put into a pending queue where it has to be approved by an administrator. Next. We also have a recent update section where administrators or advanced users who have achieved a certain number of reputation points can actually review recent edits and say, yeah, you know, that's great. I give it a thumbs up. Or, you know, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure we don't have that, you know, species in that diameter here. I'm going to give that a thumbs down. So in some ways it becomes like other crowdsourcing projects like Wikipedia where it's partially self-policing. People watch out for people who might potentially be abusing the system. Next. We also have a number of data quality checks. Um, you know, bulk or duplicate trees can be removed during data upload. There's watch lists. Uh, we use a series of reputation points where as people gain experience, they unlock new fields to be able to edit. Next. There's also administrative oversight. So it's not just the, you know, the, the users can do whatever they want and run around willy-nilly. There, there is administrative oversight to be able to view recent activity, review comments and images that are uploaded, and manage the user groups to make sure that there is some oversight in the system. Next. Um, so one of the great case studies for this project, oh, and it looks like some of the um, graphics didn't come through on that slide. Um, that's okay, we can talk about the text that's there. Uh, Colleen Vargas is the project manager for the urban forest map in San Francisco. She unfortunately couldn't be here today, but she's done a great amount of analysis of the accuracy of user-generated data, and she was kind enough to share a couple of her slides with me. So in California, in the San Francisco, they had 1,380 trees added as of this was, you know, over a year, about a year and a half ago, by 264 users. Next slide. Of those, um, oh, there's the graphic. Okay, great. So she um, went, actually you can switch to the next slide, that's fine. So she did an analysis of um, what types of users are there and found that the majority of people are pretty light users, only add one to nine trees. But a few more people are moderate users, might add 10 to 50 trees, and a few people were heavy users. They added over 50 trees each. And that type of distribution is pretty common in internet projects. So she did a sample uh, looking at how uh, successful people were in adding trees, looking at 50 different trees in each user group. Next slide. She discovered that overall there was, you know, for people who were heavy users, they would sometimes have a little bit less accuracy in entering certain pieces of information. But people who, even if they only entered one or two trees, actually overall had an okay level of accuracy in entering the diameter. More importantly, this helped her figure out that sometimes when people were entering what they thought was diameter, they were actually entering circumference. So that type of information helped us adapt the system to be able to design a better user interface so people didn't get as confused. Next slide. 
We also looked at the, or she also looked at the accuracy of um, were, if people were able to select the correct at least genus, which I know is a huge concern for people. I mean, what, what's the point of mapping a tree if they're selecting the wrong genus or species? And um, actually, people were pretty successful at selecting the right genus overall. Now, obviously, this is a small sample size, and I, I'm certainly not doing justice to Colleen's research. She did an amazing job, and I, I'm giving you just the briefest overview. But this type of information was really valuable to showing that, you know, overall with a little guidance, people are able and capable of contributing good quality data to a map. Next slide. So what does this overall mean for public engagement? I think that, um, first of all, what's really exciting about OpenTreeMap is that it can be customized to an individual city. So different data fields, a different base mass, base map, your own species list. You can add in this pending, this idea of stewardship and things like that. Next. Uh, one of the really exciting things we've worked on is this idea of, of tracking stewardship. So people would be able to show when they've watered a tree and then you could search to say, I would like to see all trees that have been, haven't been watered, that are less than three inches and they haven't been watered in the last three months. Then this becomes a really great tool for directing your, your um, stewardship plan. Next, please. So here's an example of adding a stewardship activity. You can move on. And then it would display, say this person watered the tree, and it would be a way to kind of engage with people who might be tree tenders or, or citizen foresters. Next. Uh, another great way to kind of reach out to the public is, uh, is this idea of mobile. I mean, everybody loves their, their smartphone and their tablet, right? If you've ever, you know, been anywhere, it seems like everybody has one in their pocket now. So we wanted to make OpenTreeMap accessible both by tablet, as you see here, next slide, and via smartphone. So we've recently completed both an iPhone, or an iPhone version of the app and we're in the midst of an Android version of the app, and those are, are things that get people involved. So I think my last slide, next one. So how do you get people involved? Does this type of collaborative war, uh, forestry really work? Um, I think we've seen it work well in a couple of places. In, on the Grand Rapids Open Tree Map, they're having tree mapping parties. In California, in Sacramento and San Francisco, they had a great tree count where they saw how many trees they could count in a week. In Philadelphia, a group of students have used Philly Tree Map to map over 2,500 trees. It's often integrated with citizen forester classes, and I think in general it just gets people thinking about forestry. Next slide. So where can you check it out? Um, here's some places. Uh, Philly Tree Map, there's the Urban Forest Map in San Francisco, San Diego, Green Print Maps in Sacramento, and Grand Rapids Urban Forest Map, and more maps are on the way. So next slide. Um, that's my contact information. Um, Open Tree Map is a, more info is available at opentreemap.org. We're on Twitter. Um, we have links to other webinars and tutorials, so if you're interested in checking it out, you can visit there. So that's the whirlwind overview, and I'm guessing there's probably at least a few questions. Thank you so much, Deb. That is great. And yes, I'm sure we're going to have a bunch of questions. Uh, what we're going to do now is open uh, the, the floor. So if you have a question for Deb, uh, you can either type it in under the questions section. We've already got a couple there. Um, or if you want, you can uh, raise your hand and uh, we will try to answer you and call on you so you can ask it over the line. So uh, just first up, uh, tell me a little bit about what it would take for uh, a nonprofit or a city, you know, how, how do they actually get started on doing something sure. like this using Open Tree Map? They just go to the website and you said they would need to hire a specialist. So just tell me what, what that would look like. Sure. Um, well, I think that there's a couple ways to approach it. Uh, first of all, if you're in an area that's already covered by an existing tree map, I would make contact with the people in that area. So, you know, here in Philly, our tree map covers 13 counties in three different states. If you happen to be in one of those counties, email me. <laughs> um, I think that's one thing that's important to remember. Open tree map doesn't have to cover a single municipality. It can cover a very broad geographic region. We're working on one that's an entire like, I mean, it's huge. It, it's, it's more than three states. And so I think that it's, it, it's important to remember that it's a very collaborative initiative. And so it will take somebody with software development experience to, to set something like this up. It, it's just, it's a complicated piece of software. And we've tried to make it as simple as possible, but when you're messing around with maps, it, it's never simple. But certainly 
There are resources available online because it is an open source project. We operate a mailing list. Um, you can sign up to receive updates about that. Uh, if you have a developer internally or, or maybe you've partnered with a computer science department at a local college and they download the code, and if they have questions, you can send them to that mailing list and, and our developers will help answer those questions. We certainly can partner on with creating an open tree map. Keelene and some of her crew can also help partner and fill with uh, on creating an open tree map. The goal, I, I guess, there's multiple routes that you can go on to, to make something like this happen. Um, certainly partnerships are one of the best ways to approach this and I guess that's what I would recommend. Visiting the website, checking out what other people are doing, seeing if there's people in your area you can partner with. Excellent. Thank you. We've got a, a couple questions uh, that are coming in over the line about connecting with inventories that people may already have. So for example, um, I want to ask, we have a TRIMS, T-R-I-M-S, tree inventory, which is uh, address-based. Is there a way to link this database to open tree map? Nelf asked about an iTree assessment data set. Can that be uploaded to populate uh, a, using the open tree map software? Sure. Um, well, we definitely have it set so that we can bulk upload existing inventories. I mean, it's we're not trying to say that all previous collecting was, was pointless. It's, it certainly wasn't. I think that you need to have some trees in there to get people interested. And so um, previous cities have uploaded from uh, an Excel file or a shape file or something like that. We also can potentially integrate directly into an existing works management system or something like that. That depends on the work management system and how open they are, but certainly if the data exists as some type of thing you can export, <laughs> it can be uploaded into OpenStreetMap. And we're working on the idea of, of creating something where people would actually be able to upload things themselves so um, that it can be much more active and, and lots of people can take part in it. We don't want it to be a silo. Your data should never be trapped inside a, a, an open tree map. That, that's not a good piece of software if you can't get information out of it. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've got a couple questions about um, species and if open tree map uh, is at all linked to uh, sort of uh, questions straight from the do you have an index which matches geography, topography, and climate to good species match? We would love to have something like that. Um, I should preface the answer to this question by saying that OpenTreeMap is very much still under active development. We, we are regularly working on it. We're contributing new features. So suggestions like that are exactly what we need to hear right now. And if you have other ideas of features, you know, please email me, let me know, tweet us, whatever. Um, what we've done with species thus far is that the individual city provides us with a species list. We think it's really important to define the species because we don't want people just typing in random species names because one, people can't spell English words, much less Latin words, and two, we don't want them to be picking a species that just isn't in existence in that, that climate zone. So in the future, we think it would be awesome if we could configure some way where Depending on your location, we link to, I don't know, maybe the U4 species list or some master species list from Forest Service where you would automatically get the cut of species that makes sense for your geographic area and then you can kind of trim down from there. We're not there yet. Right now we still work by just um, including whatever species are provided to us by the, the specific organization. Excellent. Thanks so much. We just have time for a couple more questions, and there are a lot. So thank you, everyone, who's asked a question. We are going to uh, compile these and many of them answered as we can for you. Here's a, a quick question from David Dannenberg. Can the data be sorted by such fields as gaps, species, overhead conditions, adjacent conditions, et cetera? That's a good question. Um, Right now we have a basic data model that focuses on certain fields associated with the tree. Um, so things like species, diameter, tree height, canopy condition, whatever. And to a certain extent that is all customizable. The organization can define those fields as whatever they would like. 
if there is a field in the database, that field can be made something called an advanced search filter. So cities choose to use the advanced search filters in different ways. You might have an option though where you let people search by different tree conditions or you let people search by uh, different projects. You, you know, so maybe there's a project that's emerald ash borer treatment and maybe there's another project that's champion trees or, or whatever. And so those type of things can be defined differently depending on the map. And uh, again, it's this balance. We want to provide some structure because we know there's some of the same issues that are faced in every community, but we also want to provide flexibility because we know that different communities are going to focus on different things. So I guess the answer to your question is kind of, <laughs> which I know is not very satisfactory. <laughs> Oh, it's a, it's a complex question, and we've got uh, probably one more we'll take right now that you can give us a ballpark estimate, but a lot of people are asking uh, if they want to implement something like this in their city, uh, what might be um, sort of an expected cost for the person? Um, so I, again, am going to have to be very vague and say it varies because it really does. There's a number of different options in OpenTreeMap. Um, you know, there's the mobile application, which some people want, some people don't. There is the ability to um, link into a works management system, which some people want and some people don't. Some people want a long-term support contract. Some people want, you know, to do the, de the design of the site themselves. Others are like, we hate graphic design with a passion and we don't even want to think about it. So it really does vary dramatically. I, I guess my one thing to think of at least if you're going through us, the cost is the same if it's a single city or if it's a much broader geographic area because we have to do the same number of steps no matter what. So I know I keep harping on this word partner, but partnerships are so important for tree technology. The other thing to think of in terms of cost is that it is open source. You know, find your developer friends. If you have someone who is a software developer, if you can partner with a local college, this is a great type of project that, that type of group can take on. So in that case, the cost is pizza to feed the kids, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. It, it, it really does vary. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess pizza and soda, if they're a little bit older, I guess we can provide adult beverages. <laughs> but, um, you know, if, if you have specific questions, email me, that's, that's the best. Or, you know, if you want to take it on in-house but need some advice, we have our mailing list. That's another great option. Awesome. Thank you so much, Deb. That was great. Thank you. We are going to hold other questions, our second question and answer session at the end, but we are going to introduce our next presenter, Phil Silva. Phil is the uh, co-founder and co-director of TreeKit, and he's a PhD student currently in natural resources at Cornell University. Phil's work focuses on informal adult learning and participatory action research in socio-ecological systems. For the past four years, Phil has taught courses in urban forestry, environmental history, and design at the New School. And in 2011, Phil was one of 25 national leaders convened by the U.S. Forest Service to participate in the Vibrant Cities and Urban Forest Task Force. He's worked with some of New York's leading environmental organizations and AC Tree member organizations, including Sustainable South Bronx, uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, Just Food, and the South Bronx River Watershed Alliance. Phil is a recipient of the 2010 iLab Residency of the Interdisciplinary Laboratory for Art, Nature, and Dance, and a 2009 Fellow of the Environmental Leadership Program. He currently serves, as I mentioned, as the co-founder and co-director of TreeKit, which is an initiative to measure, map, and collaboratively manage urban forests. We're about to hear a lot more about that. A native of Newark, New Jersey, with a graduate degree in urban policy analysis, Phil is dedicated to exploring nature in all of its urban expressions and he's going to tell us more about that right now. Bill, let me uh, thank you for joining us and take it away. We should have cleared up the problems with the uh, slide advancing, and you should be able to take it on on your own. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Can Leland yep. hear me at least, I suppose? All right. That's great. Um, thank you, uh, Leland and Sarah, and honestly, everyone at ACT Trees um, for the opportunity to talk a bit about TreeKit. Um, we really appreciate all the work that you guys do to promote urban forests and to get more and more people involved uh, in caring for urban forests. And it's always a real treat to, uh, to be on the line with Deb. Uh, TreeKit has been 
uh, increasingly interfacing with uh, Zavea in recent years, and it's just been it's been fantastic. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how the two projects uh, touch uh, in certain places as I keep going. Um, a couple of things I just want to say at the outset, and if you have to sort of drop off the call to finish your lunch or get back to your day, the three main topics I sort of want to touch on are, are this. First, it's the idea that urban forests are predominantly human ecosystems, and I think so many of us are tree people that we, we get lost in the treeness of what we're doing, but really urban forests are predominantly human ecosystems, and therefore urban forestry needs to be responsive to human needs and human dreams, so we'll talk a bit about that. Second, um, the idea that volunteers have the potential to manage urban forests as well as professionals um, if professional tools are made available to them. Um, and you've already seen how that might go from Deb's uh, presentation about Open Tree Map. Uh, and the third point I sort of want to make sure I cover is this idea that making an inventory or a map of trees is a, a process that can build interest and investment in stewardship. So basically, the process is just as important as the product. There's a real opportunity to, uh, to create interest and investment in stewardship as a result of doing this, um, and that they're not mutually, mutually exclusive. Um, so TreeKit generally, and we're still on this slide, Leland, so we're good. Uh, TreeKit generally is a way um, to get data onto a platform like OpenTreeMap, and it was great to hear some questions about how that might happen. Um, and, you know, you saw all of the wonderful green dots that Deb had, and she, um, she talked about the, uh, you know, loading existing inventories in, and in a lot of situations, folks have fantastic inventories, or inventories that are good enough and ready to be um, edited in the crowdsourced way that Deb presented. There are other situations where some places might not have an inventory at all to begin with, or their existing inventory is in pretty bad shape, and it's in those situations that TreeKit is sort of the niche to address the situation. So um, let me see if I can advance this thing. Okay, great. So uh, like Leland said, TreeKit is essentially an initiative to help people collaboratively measure, map, and then collaboratively manage urban forests. And getting back to that first point that I had, um, like I said, urban forests are predominantly human ecosystems. This is a view of the urban forest on um, 9th Street in the East Village in New York City, and I think this is a unique view because there's only one person on the sidewalk at this point. Um, but really, when we're out doing our work, we see all sorts of surprises, like this red stiletto that was left on a bollard protecting a young tree. I don't know how that ended up there, but it was a nice reminder that, you know, people are around doing crazy things around trees. Um, there's, a, you know, there are situations like this where people get really creative with the way in which they express their love for a tree and the way that they protect a tree. And so this was a tree guard uh, installed in the Brooklyn Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn, not far from the Brooklyn Bridge. And of course, there you have some, um, some woodwork that celebrates the bridge. And so, you know, this is just as much a cultural act as it's an environmental act. Um, and even situations like this, after there's been tree pruning, this, you know, this struck me as looking like a, a, an Andy Goldsworthy sculpture all of a sudden found on the side of the sidewalk. Um, again, it's just it's evidence that people are involved in managing or interacting with the urban forest. Um, and TreeKit really is informed by a lot of work that uh, my co-founder and co-director Liz Barry and I have done over the years. This is a friend of mine in the South Bronx um, named Eva. She's sort of the mayor of her block on Manita Street, and she goes out on a regular basis with those very sophisticated forestry tools that you see there. Um, that are uh, incredibly effective, and she picks the trash out of the tree beds, and she waters the trees, and she harangues her neighbors into doing the same thing. And Eva's sort of a, you know, a lone ranger. She does this work every now and then. She gets folks to help her out, but it's mostly a, a solo project for her. Um, but then there are folks that start to get together and, and do this kind of work together. These are students of mine at the New School who uh, received what's called the Citizen Pruner License in New York City. Um, and they formed a little club, and they would start to go out um, on Sunday mornings, if you can believe it, undergraduates taking Sunday mornings to go out and prune trees. Here they are doing that work together, and so it starts to become a social project. Um, and I just, going back, I want to note that one of my students is wearing a bow tie in this photo. Um, and in this photo, everyone's very nicely dressed as well doing this work. Um, and so you don't have to dress like a uh, forester in order to do urban forestry. Uh, folks can come out in all sorts of clothes. And these are um, folks from a Merchants Association and volunteers of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden 
widening tree beds uh, in the Prospect Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn. So again, just to reemphasize that all of this stewardship um, really adds up to, to reemphasizing that urban forests are, are about people just as much as they are about trees. Um, and this is, this is the result. After they widened that tree bed, the, um, the store owner in front of that uh, spot started actually actively caring for that tree and put some ferns out every day. Um, so this brings us to how people are going about um, managing their work, in particular because we're increasingly relying on volunteers to do professional scale uh, tree management or tree stewardship. Um, it begs the question, how are people actually sort of tracking that work and managing that work? And right now, I think in a lot of circumstances, what you see here is pretty much as sophisticated as those tools get for most volunteers. Folks are hand drawing their own maps, they're using marble notebooks to keep in touch with one another about who did what and when. And, you know, at this day and age, you have to sort of sit back and say there's got to be a better way. Um, and so, uh, tree Kit is coming out of the crucible of New York City, and uh, in New York City, the New York City Department of Parks, which manages the urban forest, um, has an address-based um, inventory of trees that is somewhat incomplete, hasn't been quite kept up to date, um, and is not spatially based. Like I said, it is address-based, and this diagram will be familiar to anyone who uses an address-based system. Um, the trouble is when you try to turn an address-based system um, into a spatially accurate system, you end up with points in some wacky places. Um, and this is exactly that. This is an effort to take the address-based system from the New York City inventory um, and use an algorithm to splay those points out into where they're supposed to be. Um, now, those of us who work more in urban forestry and are more familiar with it can interpret this kind of map and work with it. It's not perfect, but we can figure it out. But when it comes to folks with relatively low map literacy, um, or just volunteers in general, this just doesn't work. Um, it, it's the fact that the likely street trees are on top of the building footprint or in the middle of the street or forming that strange crop circle, which is some kind of technical glitch um, that you see uh, at the top of the screen. This, this just muddles any effort um, to, to use this data in a management-based way. Um, and so, and just as proof of this, uh, New York City, as part of the Million Trees uh, campaign, started to try to map newly planted trees in order to support um, and uh, track stewardship activities. And the, there was a, a lot of difficulty in uh, understanding what was going on with that map. Um, and we also have apps like Trees Near You, which take data sets like that and uh, turn them into mobile apps. But the fact is that because the, uh, the data set is not quite perfect, and again, it's not exactly spatially right, um, it ends up confusing people just as much as it ends up helping them. Um, so the idea for TreeKit is essentially, first off, creating really highly accurate inventories that can then be fed into a system like OpenTreeMap um, with additional features, which we've been working with Azavea to develop, that allow stewards to track the work that they've done, um, see past activities that they've watered a particular tree, pruned a particular tree, mulched a particular tree, to see the work that others have done so that all of that data becomes public. Um, and then you can make, and you know, if you're a store that's going out to water trees on a particular day on your block, you check the website before you go out and you see that one of your neighbors already watered half of them. That allows you to move on to the other trees that haven't been cared for. And finally, to connect with one another in order to form um, the kinds of loose associations that we see really helping to support people to keep doing this work. So those are our three objectives, is to uh, build a tool that allows people to track and see and connect. Um, and again, like I said, we're really, we're working with Azavea to um, cook in these kinds of stewardship management functions into that open source code that is OpenTreeMap. Um, so for us in New York City, we really needed to get a better inventory. Um, and I'll admit that this is an, ours is a niche approach. Um, and we just started from the ground up. We kind of took the tack that we were going to pretend that the existing inventory didn't exist. Um, and we were going to use really low cost tools uh, to create a new spatially accurate inventory. And this is our toolkit. Um, in fact, we've whittled it down from this. This was about $100 worth of tools. That complex Forester's DBH tape we've managed to replace with a $1.99 Taylor tape measure from the local drugstore. And we use an engineering, uh, an engineering um, rolling tape measure um, and a clipboard uh, to take data. And the process is this, we go out and uh, we train up local organizations to do this work and um, we get right on the ground 
And the way we work is this. We use the actual geometry of the street to triangulate a, a point from which we start to map with our little measuring wheel. And it's just those, you see those two magenta lines that come out and intersect beyond the fillet of the curb edge. Um, and we treat that like a start point for measuring. And it's really easy to eyeball that out in the field. And it's really easy for us back in GIS to draw this exact intersection. And we know the latitude and longitude of that. And from that, we can know the latitude and longitude of everything else we map in a line. And you'll see what that means in a bit. So we start from that start point. Um, and we roll our little rolling wheel to the edge of the first tree bed. And we note that distance. Um, we measure the length and width of the bed. And you see how that starts to add up graphically. We take the diameter at breast height of the tree at that moment. We note the species, and since we're working with volunteers, we use every means available to, um, to develop some idea of what the species might be. And we rate the confidence with which the volunteers were able to identify that species. So if they had low confidence, we know that we can come back and try to fix that up. And we keep doing this iteratively over and over down the block, hitting every tree bed until we get to an endpoint that's figured out in the same way. And all of that data gets put into a specially written script. This is, this is our very complicated data logger. Um, and all of that gets uh, entered on a proprietary website that we've developed that takes that linear data and turns it into what's called a shape file. Um, so it creates a, um, a spatially accurate inventory of all the trees. And in the process, I'll note, we also get the tree beds. So um, not only do we know what tree is out there, but we know the house it lives in. And that's important because, of course, trees can come and go, but the bed stays there. And so we can start to use that, um, that data of change over time to understand which beds might not be viable for trees or which uh, particular species of trees. So this is um, that same uh, existing New York City inventory. Um, and I'm just going to layer on top the actual trees that are there on the street based on tree kit mapping and remove the New York City trees. And you can see the difference right there. There were a lot of trees in the inventory that no longer exist there, trees that died but were never taken out of the inventory, um, spatially inaccurate because they were based on address. And as a result of us doing that sort of case-by-case -case roll down the street, we end up with a much cleaner situation. I'll just show it again there. Leland, you've got to travel. Um, let's go ahead here. Uh, and then we use diameter at breast height to approximate what the canopy might look like based on um, some simple coefficients. So we've mapped neighborhoods like Prospect Heights in Brooklyn. Uh, that was about 40 blocks. And we've actually mapped about 500 blocks uh, in western Queens. Um, so our data set is up to about 10,000 tree beds at this point, some of them empty, most of them full. Um, and we've done some work in the neighborhoods of East Harlem and Gowanus. Um, and in fact, last week we did a pilot project on St. Claude, uh, St. Claude Boulevard, I believe, in New Orleans, looking to possibly help them develop their first comprehensive inventory. Um, and so it's a system that essentially lends itself to any straight edged street. And we're working on um, a means of shifting it over even to curved streets as well. Um, and the thing to really emphasize about this is that we do this work with volunteers, with people who really have no background in either mapping or urban forestry, but come out with us and in the process of taking these three hour walks together with us, end up learning a good deal about the urban forest and actually start to develop an affinity for it. We like to tell them at the start of a, a mapping party that by the time they're done with us, they will be able to identify at least five to 10 common street tree species. And more often than not, they can. Um, and it becomes a sort of transactional incentive for them to come back or even to come the first time. That learning is really something that pulls them into the experience. Um, I unfortunately seem to have dropped the contact slide on here, but um, you can feel free to check us out at www.treekit.org. Um, and if you'd like to follow up with me, it's uh, philip with one L, P-H-I-L-I-P, at treekit.org. Um, and that's it, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Phil. Fascinating to see uh, how you're doing out, out there in New York. All right, we are uh, ready to take some more questions here. So just as before, start typing them in, and we will get to as many as we can in the next couple minutes. 
So uh, I guess one of the questions that I have is, this looks really awesome, Phil. How hard would it be for, you know, I, I know you've put a lot of work and a lot of time and effort into developing um, both your system and the propriet proprietary website. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, how, how hard would it be for someone to replicate something like this in their city? It's not that hard, actually. Um, it's, it takes a little bit of access to the city's um, GIS uh, hoard, which most cities at this point at least have basic um, GIS files, uh, or shape files, excuse me. In other words, maps of things like the street bed and the, um, the sidewalk edges. Um, and from that, we can set up um, everything that's necessary to create the start and end points um, back in the lab that triangulate with what you find out in the street. The process of actually doing the street work is incredibly simple. I mean, in New Orleans, we just, uh, Liz, uh, the tree kit co-director, went down and was there on other business, took a kit with her, organized some other folks who were interested, and they just went out and rolled. So the barrier entry is fairly low, um, and everything that we've developed that's quote-unquote proprietary is really just um, it, it's, you know, you just have to get in touch with us and we start working with you to use those tools. We're in the process of updating and hopefully developing a, um, a mobile data entry app so that we're no longer relying on pen and paper and then data entry after the fact. It would allow people to actually put the numbers straight into the database from their phone or tablet out in the field. That's pending toward the end of 2013. Um, we'll hopefully have that available. So that will even lower the barrier to entry a little bit more. Excellent. And um, is someone dedicated to data input and how much, um, you know, how much time does that take? It takes quite a bit of time right now, to be perfectly honest, um, because we, you know, the reason we're taking such a, um, a detailed approach to this and literally going out with these little rolling tape measures is because, at least in New York, um, we really want a highly accurate inventory, both for supporting stewards who are managing the urban forest but also for research questions. You know, now that we're ending up with details about the square footage of um, tree beds, we can start to actually understand the total surface area of, of permeable surface and start asking questions about stormwater management. So um, the data entry, to come back to that, ends up taking a little bit of time because we're really trying our best to get this as clean as possible. Um, right now, typically when we have a project, we make sure that we secure funding to support um, uh, data, a crew of data enterers, um, and um, it's hard to say exactly how long it takes because, of course, different streets have different numbers of trees on them, and the more trees, the longer it takes. Um, it's not an inordinate amount of time when it gets done, but it is something that needs to be factored in um, in terms of uh, just a, a project schedule uh, if anyone wants to do this. Excellent. And uh, again, some other questions that really have to do with uh, you know, addresses versus satellite versus, um, well, here's, here's a straight up question. Sure. It seems like GPS would be ideal for mapping the tree locations. Is that a component of either system? Can you repeat that, Leland? I'm sorry. It seems like GPS would be ideal for mapping the tree locations. Is that a component of either system? And really, um, we have a lot of questions just about GPS and yeah. uh, integrating spatially based systems with address based systems. I can say that in New York City, we're challenged by GPS. Um, the readings are often inaccurate, and part of that is because of our tall buildings and what's called the canyon effect. Um, and we've found that we're actually achieving greater accuracy to the foot using this system than using a GPS system. But also with GPS, you only end up with a point, not with the polygon of the tree bed itself. So. This, you know, it's not to say that GPS isn't an appropriate approach for logging locations, particularly if you have that kind of data logger. This is cheaper, and we feel um, a little bit more detailed and accurate than just a GPS-based approach. And I, if I can cut in, I can answer for Open Tree Map, if yep. you don't mind, Phil. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Go ahead, Deb. So we we had the same issue that Phil just talked about. Um, so the, the idea of the um, using GPS and the urban canyon effect with uh, signals bouncing off of tall buildings. Um, so what we do for the main website for Open Tree Map is that you start by entering an address. And when that happens, uh, a map pops up with a dot for 
uh, geocoded to the center of the parcel, which is what Google returns when, when you give it an address. But we don't let people add a tree at that point. They, if they try, they get a big, ugly error message saying, you have not moved the dot from the default location. They have to move the dot to off that, that first place where it's put by Google to what we hope is a more accurate location. Is it going to be as accurate as the process that TreeKit's doing? Absolutely not. I can guarantee that. But it at least is one data quality method that we, we p implemented so that we weren't getting, you know, really weird things with people putting trees on top of buildings. Um, we do, however, for the mobile application, utilize the GPS in the phone if people have it turned on. So again, it's the same process. The dot would drop on the map where the phone thinks you are, but then you have to drag the dot to the exact location. But it's always tough in cities just because yeah. of the, the tall buildings. It really is. Just, just to add to what Deb said, you know, for those of you who are dealing with maybe five or six story buildings, um, if you're looking at satellite imagery, typically there's a tilt to it. And so um, the building will actually sort of cover, visually cover the sidewalk shed. And so it makes it even more difficult to know exactly where to drop that point down. Other factors like whether or not the satellite imagery was taken uh, during full leaf out or during the winter makes it relatively easier or hard to actually figure out where to drop the point. So there are all these factors that can either make uh, either a satellite imagery point dropping approach or a GPS approach more or less appropriate for what you're trying to do. I think in an ideal situation, you would you would have data collected by the method that tree kit uses, where you know it's it's not just a point, it's a polygon for that tree bed. And then you would take that information, that that polygonal layer, and upload it into something like OpenTreeMap or another system and then lock those down. So people yeah. couldn't move the tree. I mean right now in an open tree map the location isn't locked. I, I mean, unless you've set the trees to be read-only, then every, everything's locked. But otherwise, they can move their location. But, you know, Phil and his crew do their thing. We get an awesome shape file layer. We lock down that location. I, that would be ideal. I, you know. And since all of you have so many extra resources for this, I'm sure it'll happen tomorrow, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, not definitely not overnight for anybody, but this is a, a great example of what folks are doing in different cities around the country to help map their urban forests and to engage their community to make it happen. I want to thank you both so much for presenting this afternoon. I think you've inspired a lot of people, certainly the questions attest to that. We are going to collect some more questions that uh, we weren't, didn't have time to ask over the phone. I hope you guys might not mind answering some of them and we'll post them uh, on our website. That for everyone fun. who is listening in still, thank you for participating in today's AC Trees webcast session. These presentations, a recording of the whole session, uh, and an accompanying resource list will be available in about one week. Uh, we will mail that link out to that to everyone who completes our brief survey, which is going to show up on uh, a, right after this session, when we, when we end the session. So please take a quick second to fill out that survey. Just want you all to know, our next AC Trees webcast will be uh, in February on the 21st, that's the third Thursday, and it will be about public policy and advocacy for trees and our 2013 public policy agenda. So we hope you'll listen into that. A big thank you to Deb Boyer and to Phil Silva. We really appreciate uh, your perspective on urban tree mapping today. A lot of people want to get in on this, and I'm sure this is just the start of a, of a much longer conversation and more sessions on this topic. Thank you both for taking your time, and thanks to everyone who listened in. We hope everyone has a great afternoon. Take care, everyone. <laughs>